In this section, we're going to be looking at the convergence properties of the Fourier transform. Essentially, this is dealing with some of the more mathematically subtle issues that revolve around the convergence of integrals. Because the forward and inverse Fourier transform equations involve integrals, there's always the possibility that we can encounter problems when integrating. Either the integral might not converge at all, for example, it blows up to infinity, or the integral might not converge to the particular function to which we would like it to converge. When we speak of the convergence of the Fourier transform, what exactly is the issue we're talking about? This is what I'd like to discuss on this slide. So suppose that we have an arbitrary function little x that we'd like to represent using a Fourier transform representation. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the function little x and substitute it into the Fourier transform analysis equation, in other words this equation here, and this will give us the Fourier transform of that function which we denote as big X. Then we take the function big X and we substitute it into the Fourier transform synthesis equation, in other words this equation here. Now if all is well and good in the world, then the result that we get from this integration on the right hand side of the equation, in other words the function that we're denoting as tilde x, should be equal to the function little x. But the subtlety here is that tilde x might not be equal to little x, and there's various reasons that this can be the case. Uh, one thing that can arise is that when we compute this integral here in the Fourier transform analysis equation, this integral can fail to converge, in which case big X is not even well defined, and then because big X is not well defined, this, this whole right hand side here is not well defined either. But even if big X is well defined, we also can run into the problem that when we evaluate this integral here, that this integral is not well defined, even though big X might be well defined. So these are the sorts of issues that we're dealing with when we talk about the convergence of the Fourier transform. It's essentially whether these integrals converge. And since the Fourier transform is essentially derived from Fourier series, the convergence properties of the Fourier transform are very closely related to the convergence properties of Fourier series. So fortunately, our knowledge of the convergence properties of Fourier series will be quite helpful to us in our study of the convergence properties of the Fourier transform. The first theorem that I need to introduce concerning the convergence properties of the Fourier transform relates to the case of finite energy functions. So if a function x is of finite energy, in other words, this integral here converges to a finite value, then the Fourier transform representation of x converges in the mean squared error sense. In other words, this particular condition here is satisfied, where x represents our original function and x tilde represents the Fourier transform representation of the function. So effectively what we're saying is that the energy and the difference between these two functions is equal to zero. Now the particular condition that's necessary for this theorem to apply, in other words the condition that the function has to have finite energy, in practice this condition is normally satisfied because in practice we usually deal with functions that have finite energy. Um, it's important to note, however, that mean squared error convergence does not necessarily imply pointwise convergence. In other words, it doesn't imply that this particular condition is true. So for this reason, this particular theorem is not useful for determining specific numeric values that the Fourier transform representation converges to. In other words, if we want to determine what x tilde is equal to for specific po at specific points, we can't determine this using this theorem because it doesn't ensure that we have pointwise convergence. In other words, this condition here is not necessarily true. So for this reason, this particular theorem on this slide is most useful in situations where we simply want to determine whether the Fourier transform representation converges, but we're not necessarily trying to find specific numeric values for what it converges to. The next theorem that I need to introduce concerning the convergence properties of the Fourier transform relates to functions that satisfy a set of conditions known as the Dirichlet conditions. So before introducing this theorem, I first need to introduce the Dirichlet conditions. So the Dirichlet conditions are a set of three conditions that a function may or may not satisfy. So in particular, the Dirichlet conditions for the function x are as follows. The first condition is the function x is absolutely integrable. In other words, this integral here converges to a finite value. The second condition is on any finite interval, the function x has a finite number of maxima and minima. In other words, x is of bounded variation. 
And the third condition is on any finite interval, the function x has a finite number of discontinuities, and each discontinuity is itself finite. So there's two parts to this condition. First, the number of discontinuities is finite. And secondly, the, the uh, jump in the function corresponding to each one of these discontinuities is also finite. On the bottom half of this slide, I have some examples of functions that violate the Dirichlet conditions. So the first function, the one on the left here, whose formula is given by 1 over t times u of t, this particular function violates the first Dirichlet condition, the condition of absolute integrability, because if we take the magnitude of this function and integrate it over the entire domain of the function, the integral fails to converge. In particular, it blows up to infinity. The second function, the one that's given by this particular formula here, this particular function violates the second Dirichlet condition, uh, because of this factor sine of 2 pi over t, this function oscillates more and more quickly as you approach the origin. So in this portion of the graph that's uh, uh, marked by this dot, 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 in this small interval here, which is an interval of finite length, there's actually an infinite number of oscillations in this function. In other words, an infinite number of maxima minima. So this violates the second condition, which says that over any finite interval, the function must have a finite number of maxima and minima. And then the last function, the one shown on the bottom of the slide here, um, this requires a little bit more explanation about what this graph is really trying to show. Essentially what we have is a function that's a staircase in shape, where the step, each uh, step in the staircase is one half the size of the previous step. So the width of this step and the height of this step is each one half. And then in the next step, the width and height is a quarter. And then in the next step, the width and height is one eighth and so on. And in this last little portion of the graph here, which is marked by the dot, 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 in order for these, these staircases to reach the value of zero, which is what happens at the point t equal to one, there's actually an infinite number of steps in the staircase here. So this particular function violates the third Dirichlet condition, which says that on any finite interval, the function has to have a finite number of discontinuities, and each discontinuity itself must be finite. This particular function violates the first part of this, which is that the number of discontinuities have to be finite because over this little finite interval where the dot 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 appears, there's actually an infinite number of uh, discontinuities in this function. And finally, one observation that we can make about these functions that are shown here is that they're probably unlikely to be encountered in practice. In the case of this first function, because this function is unbounded, it's unlikely that we would encounter this function in practice because again, usually the functions that we're dealing with represent some physical quantities from the real world and physical quantities tend not to assume infinite values. In the case of this second function, we're probably unlikely to encounter this in practice because due to this portion of the graph near the origin where the function's inf oscillating infinitely fast, this function would have an infinite amount of energy as it turns out. And because we tend not to encounter functions with infinite amounts of energy, this would be unlikely to be encountered in practice. And then this last function here is just downright strange. Like we have to try really hard to construct such a function and it's unlikely that you would encounter such a function in practice. And although these are only three examples of functions that violate the Dirichlet conditions, we can make similar comments about the general case. In other words, generally speaking, most functions that we encounter in practice will tend to satisfy the Dirichlet conditions simply because functions that do not satisfy these conditions tend to exhibit very unusual behavior that's unlikely to be seen in practice. The last theorem that I need to introduce concerning the convergence properties of the Fourier transform relates to the case of functions that satisfy the Dirichlet conditions. So if a function x satisfies the Dirichlet conditions, there's two things that we can say about the convergence of the Fourier transform representation of x. The first is that the Fourier transform representation of x, which is denoted by x tilde, converges pointwise everywhere to x, except at the points of discontinuity of x. But what makes this theorem so powerful is it goes on to say what happens in the places where the function x is not continuous. And this is the second item here. So at each point ta of discontinuity of x, the Fourier transform representation converges to the value given by this particular formula here, where ta plus denotes a value which is very slightly greater than ta, and ta minus denotes a value which is very slightly less than ta. In other words, this right-hand side here is simply the average of the left and right limits of the function x as you're approaching the discontinuity at the point ta.
The theorem just introduced is extremely useful in practice. The first reason for this is the conditions that need to be satisfied for the theorem to be applicable, namely the Dirichlet conditions, are usually met for most functions of practical interest. The second reason that this theorem is quite useful is that not only does it tell us if the Fourier transform representation converges, but it also tells us the specific numerical value that the Fourier transform representation converges to at each point. This is useful in situations where we want to know not just if the Fourier transform representation converges, but what specifically it converges to. At this point I'd like to consider an example to illustrate how we can make use of the theorem introduced on this slide. And in particular I'd like to consider example 6.6. In this example, we're given the function x that's shown in the figure, so this figure here, and we're told that x hat denotes the Fourier transform representation of x. In other words, x hat is given by this highlighted formula here, where the capital X that appears in this formula denotes the Fourier transform of the function little x. And what we're asked to do in this example is determine what the Fourier transform representation of x converges to at the points minus one half and plus one half. So the first observation we can make is that the function x satisfies the Dirichlet conditions. So again, the Dirichlet conditions are a set of three conditions. The first is that the function is absolutely integrable. The second is that over any finite interval, the function has a finite number of maxima and minima. And the third condition is over any finite interval, the function has a finite number of discontinuities, each of which is finite. And clearly the function x satisfies each of these three conditions. So because the function x satisfies the Dirichlet conditions, we can use the convergence result for the Fourier transform representation that relates to functions that satisfy the Dirichlet conditions. So in particular, in this example, we're asked to find what the Fourier transform representation converges to at the point minus one half, which is this point here, and the point one half, which is this point here. And you'll notice that each of these points, minus one half and plus one half, are points at which the original function x has discontinuities. And if you remember, the convergence theorem that we have for the Fourier transform representation that involves the Dirichlet conditions says that at points of discontinuity, the Fourier transform converges to the average of the left and right limits. So for example, if we're trying to compute the, what the uh, Fourier transform representation converges to at the point t equal to minus one half, because this is a point of discontinuity of the function x, the Fourier transform representation will converge to the average of the left and right limit at this point. So at this point you can see from the graph that the left limit is 0 and the right limit is 1. So the average of 0 and 1 is 1 half, so the value that we get for the Fourier transform representation at the point minus 1 half is simply the average of 0 and 1, which is 1 half. Then if we consider the point t equal to one half, and what the Fourier transform representation converges to at this point, again this is a point of discontinuity of the original function x, therefore the Fourier transform representation will converge to the average of the left and right limit at this point of discontinuity. So the left limit is going to be a value of one, and the right limit is going to be a value of zero. So the Fourier transform representation at the point one half is going to converge to the average of one and zero, which is simply one half.